After a long three months, it feels like finally things are starting to return to normal. The football is back, before too long pubs and restaurants are due to open again, and the glorious weather we had had has been interspersed with some more typical British rain. We're here to try and continue that sense of normality here on Inside the Circle, the podcast, and joining me this week are GB and Scotland internationals, Alan Forsyth and Chris Grassick. So first of all, guys, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on and... And how are you feeling that, you know, Chris, you're back at work. Alan, you're due to return to training very soon. Uh, how are you feeling ahead of those? Uh, yeah, good. Thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, I was, I've been off work for about three months, so it's been quite strange. At the start, it was quite fun, um, as you might expect. And then by the end, actually just desperate to to get some sort of normality back in my um in my week in life so so yeah back at work now which has been great um means a friday actually means something again which is nice um so yeah all good yeah thanks for having us um i'm looking forward to going back to normal normal training when that time comes whenever that will be but next week we start back and it'll be a slow process so go to see how that will be it'll be a bit of a weird feeling i think going in and not having a full squad, squad split in half and then in groups of four, I think it is. So it'll be interesting to see what that's like. But the golf clubs have been open, so I've been there every day for the last month. So it's been all right. And the two of you are obviously very close mates, which is why we're on together. And you live quite close to each other. But have you actually been able to see much of each other during lockdown at all? Well, at, at yeah. The, on, on that note, I think... Um, just like to say, although I look like a ghost, it's mainly my, my camera. Um, <laughs> I've been up in Scotland for a while, but I am more tanned than I, than I look. Uh, but yeah, pretty much a week a week into lockdown, I came up to Scotland with Danielle. Um, so we've been up here ever since. So now we haven't really seen much. This, this is probably the longest of not seen each other. Like, potentially ever, if I'm honest. Yeah. It's the close I, contact I that's hard it. to... Uh, the close contact's hard to kind of, you know, stay away from. Yeah, <laughs> like the, the, the three, three months is probably a, lot, a long time. I'm not, yeah. I, mean, not, I think up until 2013, we've lived less than a two minute walk away from each other. Yeah. I think. <laughs> so, it's like, it's like yeah. you're searching, you're searching on right move for your flat and, uh, it's like a uh, location from like the station, two beds, uh, location from Alan's house. <laughs> it has, honestly, since since I lived in the club flat, and I think you were at day losses, since after that, we've lived about literally two minutes max walk. And that's so three how, different flats we've been in, I think. How long have the two of you been friends then? When did you first meet each other? Under six, under sixteen, under sixteen. Yeah, probably hockey back then. They were probably they played against each other. They might not have known each other. Yeah. But under sixteen was probably the first time we properly met. Yeah. Then Just... Grass had long blonde hair to about here. <laughs> and you had short blonde hair to about. I short blonde hair, yeah, yeah, to about here. So. <laughs> I wouldn't say my lid's any better right now, to be honest. <laughs> I need to get I need to get back to London purely to get my hair cut. And Fourth of July book it open. Yeah. <laughs> and was it was it an immediate friendship? Because we spoke to M the Frond and Anna Toman a few weeks ago and it and it took for Anna to break M's thumb for them to become friends effectively. But were you did you guys sort of strike up that friendship straight away or did it just sort of was there one sort of moment where you were, I don't know, on tour or sharing or something where it, it sort of happened? I, th- I think, I kind of think it did. I just think, I don't, I don't, I don't remember if it didn't, unless it, you've, you've got a better story. But I think we just saw a, a guy from Paisley and a guy from Edinburgh with probably very different at that age school backgrounds. But um, <laughs> yeah, it seems to sort of, didn't really matter when you were at hockey. 
So just both both loved hockey, so you know yeah. what's not to get on. Yeah, and then yeah, since then sort of gone. We've always sort of came through well, kind of came through the age groups here. I think you were probably one year above me, I think, on age groups. Yeah. You then would move in and I would have one year left, sort of thing. But yeah. we saw it worked in the Scottish stuff. If you were doing the sixteens, you were likely doing the sixteens and eighteen. If you're doing the twenty ones, you're likely to do a bit of eighteen and twenty ones and then seniors and twenty ones. So you're always sort of mixed and mixed the same people sort of the whole way through up. And what was it like going through the age group stuff with Scotland? Were there any sort of particular highlights and particular memories that stand out of, of either sort of competitions you've played in or or just times that the the two of you had together? I think um, the trip the trip yeah. for me yeah. The junior stuff I always think about is, yeah, like some of the results and stuff we had, but just some of the trips you go on, like Budapest, <laughs> indoor tournament, we were like fairly, so, so a relatively new indoor team sort of put together when Russell was coach, and we hadn't really done a 21s indoor Europeans for a long time. I was sort of new to the 21s doing indoor, I think. So we were in the B division and we had like a really, like really good team, uh, a very good indoor sort of squad that went out, but we hadn't done much training or whatever together and went out. And then Budapest, where we were, were like 1980s, maybe 1960s Budapest. <laughs> it was very, very different. And uh, I think Grass and I, for five nights in a row, didn't eat the dinner that was served. Well, Grass obviously was allergic to it and I just looked at it and thought, as a 16, 17-year-old, I was like, I'm not eating that. <laughs> like we had microwave pasta for lunch and dinner yeah. for five days. That pretty much sums up a Scottish trip, to be honest. And yeah, going to like the worst part of any country, maybe, is also a big part of a Scottish trip. But I think the best... <laughs> I mean, we probably should talk about hockey moments, but the last night on that trip was one of the best nights I think we've had. Um, <laughs> well, I was, no, that was Ukraine. That's Ukraine. <laughs> no, that was another one. But on, uh, was that not the one oh, where yeah, we woke yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, foreign cheap Sorry. vodka, which doesn't, I think we were on vodka, pineapple juices or something. Oh, no, that's, that's a different one. This is better. This is, this is senior. This oh, is uh, in Austria. <laughs> <laughs> we woke up one night. Uh, we woke up after the last night, and um, the hotel our hotel room was just like covered and sick. And um, <laughs> thankfully, our manager at the time was like, "You know what? Just we we obviously tried to clean it up, and then we got home, and uh, our manager sent us an email basically being like, I think we all know what's happened. Like, send me the cleaning bill, and that'll be the end of it.'" <laughs> <laughs> and that was that but pretty much Scottish trips are generally like through kind of age group stuff was a lot about going away just with and like with mates and um, enjoying the experience and I think that's a big part about doing it yeah we seem we seem to always in the junior stuff I don't mean this in a bad way but you never really got to go is this the right way to say it like a decent country or you go to a country but you're always in Places you'd never imagine you'd ever go. Yeah. Like, I, 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 like, I would never go back. You sort of places you'd never go back to, but you've just had to go there for a hockey trip. And you're like, oh yeah, we're going, we're going to Hungary or it might be all right Budapest, but you're like completely opposite of what you probably think when you Google Budapest, Hungary. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just sort of like in the middle of nowhere, not much going on. A group of lads, to like twelve lads, indoor tournament from probably ranges I was I think I was the youngest like 17 to 21 just like nothing to do five days I think it was freezing cold if I remember correctly since middle of January or something yeah. and then you're just out there and you can't really well, no one could really eat the food I remember like two people could eat it it was honestly horrific and then you're going to the shop you're basically buying like pasta, putting hot water into a bowl and putting it in the microwave behind reception that they had for the workers. And that was your that was your meals because it was just absolute horrible food you had to eat. So yeah, that tournament we actually got promoted. I think we lost yeah. in the final to the Czechs, but we actually got like it's sort of like 
as much as we probably would now oh, at the time complain about how horrible some of the stuff is, it definitely brings you closer together yeah. on and off the pitch sort of thing. Like one of those like, let's make it worthwhile being here sort of attitudes <sighs> when you're on the pitch. And, and then I've been, I would say we're both been pretty lucky. Like all junior stuff, you sort of came through with like the same people. Yeah, which I but think that, helped what, us probably helped us as we got into the seniors because a lot of it was like people you'd played with for yeah. a lot of years when you were younger. Yeah, that that was going to be my next my next question. And for you both was it those, those trips may not have been a lot of fun, but I guess they must have um, yeah really sort of made you closer as teammates and that that would have helped then strengthen that bond as as you were going through up in up through the age groups and then into into senior ho- uh, senior hockey with Scotland yeah yeah I think um, what, probably just appreciate it a bit more don't you yeah and the, the, what was the the team that went to the 2018 commies I remember we sat and we worked it out who all played 21 together from like that sort of age group that all played at 21 at some point together and I think out this squad of 16 I'm pretty sure it was like 9 or 10 of us who were still there like 9, 10 years later they'd all be played well some more some of them had played 18s together so it was like a good 21s team that we've all basically been there and then we were still there by 2018 in the Commonwealth Games which is a pretty nice thing to have that well, as much as everyone's got their full-time jobs and done this and done that, all still sort of there together. Being able to play in for us, what the, for Scotland, the biggest tournament you can play in. So uh, you mentioned the 2018 Commonwealth Games there and, and how for Scotland that's one of the biggest tournaments you can play in. And you also have had success in a European level as well, I guess. The two of you playing together, what have sort of been your, your highlights of things that you've achieved in, in a Scotland shirt? Um, I think like overall would be to see the progress that Scotland's made as a senior team from in terms of ranking and teams that we compete with and that sort of thing. I remember first going into the seniors and you'd come up against some of the better teams and it'd be like a huge deal and wouldn't be expecting very much out of the game. Whereas the, the way it went further kind of the older we got and grew up together and the more we all we all improved we started holding our own and believing ourselves in a bit more and um i think that's probably for me like one of the biggest things i'll take away from from that was seeing scott's progress over the last 10 years yeah yeah i think pretty much bang on like we've competed as much as yeah we'd like to beat these teams and we, we know we are in some places just a bit off it with funding and like being able to train that much together but we've competed with some of the top teams in the world at times and if you look back 10 years ago we probably we, we weren't and then now like the Europeans 2017 World League 3 2017 um, we didn't go through on goal difference to the quarterfinals basically um, and then the Commonwealth game beating teams higher ranked above us um, yeah, it's sort of like just, and like we could always go back to it's like, pre- obviously there's been a couple of ins and outs and retirements and not, but it's pretty much been like a core group of us that have sort of as mates, but also teammates, been able to go all the way through sort of those tournaments together as well. Or some might have missed it for injury or work or whatever, but we've all sort of, I would say there's still been a good eight people, seven or eight people who have sort of came through everything together. And are still mates now, not just like teammates. I think it's pretty special. But if you're, yeah, I think what, what see what sums it up is like previously when you're trying to in between tournaments, you're trying to get test matches against some better teams, and if they think you're rubbish, they won't offer to play you. But towards the end of you know the last three years, probably go over to Holland and play them over a weekend. Um, other top teams are keen on. On playing you, you know, England will have have us down at Bisham, um, that sort of thing, and that's when you know you're yeah. you're actually a bit more respected and um, you're at that level. 
something you've mentioned there, 27 Europeans, and definitely want to touch on that because you won the gold medal on home turf, got promoted to the top tier for the first time, I think it was in, in 10 years. Going into that tournament, sort of what were your what were your what were your what were you thinking about you know how well you could do was were you always certain that you were just thinking about promotion or was it was it a little bit unknown going in, into that sort of week or so i think thinking about think we've been thinking about promotion for the last 10 years so yeah. that was definitely on the agenda um i think winning i think winning it because it was at home personally i think like going into it, it was but we knew we had a really good squad from what we were there and we played at home. And that's probably 2015 Euros went into it. It was a bit like, yeah, we would like to win it. But it was like, let's just get promoted. Whereas 2017, it was like, let's go and win it. Yeah, we've been, yeah promotion is key, but let's go and win it. And it was sort of, everyone sort of had that mentality. And it, it was a sort of just different feel. I don't know what what word to put it down to like but it was just a different feel really in that squad we just knew we could win it whereas in the past it's all oh, we might need to beat them here and we had France from our group who were higher ranked and had just came off playing World League 3 in South Africa, I think who and I think they finished fairly high within that they had Germany and stuff in their group but they still did really well so they were probably favourites you'd say because they've been a top team for a while now and we had them in my group and we didn't really didn't really bother us. Beat beat them two one in the opening game. And sort of from there you just knew that you're going in with a sort of good momentum to play. Apart from <laughs> the semi final from what, what four one up. And in the last five minutes it went to four three <laughs> pretty quick. Against pretty Russia. Quick. <laughs> uh, sorry, Russia, yeah. That yeah. was a bit uh, <laughs> bit of a shock to the system. We were caught, like comfortably the uh, semi final of European. We were comfortably four one up, like like all over them and then we don't really know what happened just five minutes to go I think we probably we probably thought we'd won it sort of thing and then they scored two they made a good flicker scored two good corners got it to 4-3 and then it was like wow we knew <laughs> this could get pretty pretty interesting and then they actually got a long corner but didn't go and get the ball for like five seconds and then the, the full time whistle went the hootle went yeah. So it was like if they got the ball, they could have put it in, and anything could have happened. And then, but that that's probably one of the best feelings I've actually had in a Scotland top because you've played in five semi-finals and lost. To then, <clears throat> it's just genuine tension for yeah. Like it was all that just building up over quite a few tournaments in that game, just try to get over the line basically. Um, yeah. I think the, the biggest thing about the start of that week was it was like previously we'd go into those tournaments, but oh, if we if we can win this game and if they lose that game, then we might play so-and-so in the semi. Yeah. Whereas that just wasn't part of the ethos at the start. It was like, whoever we play, we'll play, but I think we'll beat anyone So in that tournament. So um, it just kind of was just get on with it. And yeah. So you, you secured promotion in that semi-final with that 4-3 victory. And then you went and beat Wales in the final coming from behind to win 2-1 and win the gold medal. What, I guess it's a slightly tough question, but was there a particular favourite moment? Is there one that felt better than the other or were they just both really enjoyable moments for, for the different reasons? One that you'd secure promotion and the other one that you'd won the gold medal on home soil? I think, I think part of the issue for the final was we were, we'd probably expended so much energy being delighted about the semi that by the time we got to the final, we were maybe a bit like, yeah, not quite fully there, and it took us a wee while to get going. So I, personally, I'd say the semi was the biggest, semi-final was the biggest um, elation and, yeah, happiest moment. And then after that, I was like, well, we're obviously here to win it, so let's do that. But um, we just probably weren't quite sharp enough off the start and then work, worked our way back into it. I think I'd probably... Uh, has been a decent rivalry between us and Wales over the last however many years, and um, that probably came to the fore when we were losing. I could, I kind of grit the teeth and like let's let's get this win, um, kind of thing, and managed to work it back. Yeah, I think yeah, like you said, basically 
it's like they didn't even play any hockey in the first half of the final. Yeah. And then a few a few hard and tough words to each other at half time sort of got us ready and even then we didn't really play until the last quarter. So <laughs> so I didn't get start playing properly until but I think the celebration at the end of the final obviously I think it was just special because we were at home. So obviously everyone came down for the final, friends and family watching and then just being able to the relief of doing that at home with the crowd and then the actual presentation and stuff, I think. The whole game, I don't really remember much of it, to be honest with you. But I remember the semi final and I remember the celebrations at the end. And that sort of all to one. Makes it so special, I think. In in earlier on in this episode you talked about some of the, the places that you've had to travel to and some of the not so nice experiences, but then to have, have achieved something that you as a nation have been working on for ten years was it made even more special then for the fact that you managed to do it at home with friends and family there watching you live in the stadium? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, so much better. As much as when you're away, if you win something, you can still celebrate. But being able to do it with everyone, it's probably, especially for most the Scottish players, I would say, friends and family probably supported you from Whenever your hockey journey started to there, and that's been something that I've got to put up, like you've said earlier, we've tried to do this for the last 10 years. So, being able to do it with everyone there that helped you along the way, sort of things, if it's coaches or previous coaches or just simple friends and family, then yeah, that was, I, I loved it because everyone could then sort of just be there together at the pitch after the game as well, which is nice. Yeah, and that's that's what probably. That's part of the pressure is knowing that, like, you know, how much your mum and dad have invested in it. How, you know, same with other people's parents, um, friends and family, they know kind of how important it is to us. Um, and that's probably what makes it like that little bit harder and uh, sweeter when you get there kind of thing. Because you know that everyone appreciates kind of the hours you've put in and what it means to you. And, um, yeah, and then doing that at home just, yeah, it makes it 10 times better. Another event that was held in Scotland a few years before was the, the 20 com, uh, 2014 Commonwealth Games. And am I right in thinking that you both played in that tournament? Yeah. yeah. So how was that um, as an experience for you? Because the Commonwealth Games is something, it's a multi-sport event, so it's something that's so different to any other hockey tournament, really, other than the and other than the Olympics. But again, to have that massive tournament hosted in Scotland and for you guys to be playing in it, how did you how did you find that? Well, I, I loved every minute of it. To be honest, the whole whole experience was just brilliant. Um, playing playing hockey in front of whatever it was six seven thousand people in Scotland is not something you do ever. So yeah. that was unique in itself, and um, there was just such a buzz around the whole of Scotland. For, for the event and to be a part of it was just really amazing um like <laughs> we would on one of the days off before i think it was the day before the opening ceremony we were in um george square just for a wander to get out of the village and it was the most bizarre kind of unique experience for us as hockey players where you would you couldn't walk five yards without ask somebody asking you for a photo or asking you kind of about what you're doing or asking you to hold their baby and take a photo, hold their dog and take a photo. You're like, okay, this is great. You don't actually have a clue really who we are, but um, we'll go with it. Um, and it was just, it was just a totally unique experience. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I always have sort of different, I've got like two views on it. So I love the whole tournament and sort of feeling the village and like Grass just said there, just, from a hockey perspective, I was just annoyed at my own individual performance for the tournament. So I, I don't know. I'm just a bit like classic, a bit negative sort of view on it from that one thing. But it was like that bit walking through, like how many times have you walked through George Square in, in my life living there? And then one day we walk through and just we've got we're one of the team zippers on, like, you couldn't. You honestly couldn't walk anywhere without someone wanting to talk to you or 
wanting a photo with us or wanting to know when your next game was or just like, yeah, it's sort of surreal because I reckon if I walked there a week later, <laughs> it wouldn't have been like that. It wouldn't have been anywhere near the same. And then remember from we were on top of, we went to the Iron Brew sort of, what was it called? Iron Brew pop-up store. Yeah. And then they were doing like interviews on top of, basically it was like they'd made a, put together their store. And you were on top of like the container and they were doing interviews. So you're higher up and big crowds are stand waiting to, to like ask questions and stuff like that. And this is like you're standing on top of an of a container in the middle of Glasgow. And uh, just everyone was just it was I don't know, it was just so surreal that you're standing there, these like adults asking all these questions about about World well, One, about hockey, which just didn't really happen in Glasgow. And then just one no you know, when your game was come to sport and then like cheering you on when you're standing there asking a question about like who we were playing next and it was like, it was like a football feel for me like just to sort of the way the fact like the crowd were like shouting and stuff it was just so surreal and then like like I said like if you walked there a week later no one would have asked you a single thing but it was, that was pretty special being able to have that in your home your home country that you well, might not like I said, you might not have played in front of anyone like that again at home. Also got the best umbrellas from Iron Brew. Yeah. Which <laughs> I are still, mine. Like, so good. Every time I use it, I'm like, this is the best umbrella I've ever had. And everyone looks at it like Iron Brew, that's class. Uh, Zoom, our first Zoom meeting is just about to run out on us. So we'll take a short break here and we'll be back very soon to talk about uh, your exploits playing together for Surbiton and Great Britain. Subscribe to Inside the Circle, the podcast now on all of your usual podcast providers. Welcome back to Inside the Circle, the podcast, and we are still joined by Chris Grassick and Alan Forsyth. So we spent the first part of this episode talking about all of their Scotland exploits over the years, but Scotland isn't the only team they've played together for. They have also represented Great Britain together and Surbiton. So we'll, we'll start off with Surbiton, and the two of you have enjoyed a lot of success there over the years. Um, but I guess, how did you first come to, to move to the club? And, and did you move together or did you join at separate times? Did one sort of follow the other? Well, I joined um, back in like 2010. Um, Brett Garrard was the coach and Carl Stagno of the under 21s for Scotland for just one of the summer tournaments um, and yeah and kind of asked me if I wanted to move down and play there um, so that kind of brought me down and then gradually I think did Willie join before you or after so you? I, I, so I joined 2013 so I basically followed grass there and then Willie joined 2014 yeah, so there's like a bit yeah, of a sorry. been a bit of a Scottish connection, and Parks has played there as well, and um, yeah, and I suppose just moved down. And where did did you live in the flat to start with? So yes, yeah, so I moved down. Yeah, August twenty thirteen, and lived in the flat above the clubhouse for two, three years, so oh, two and a half years. Yeah, so. and then just kind of. Yeah, teams developed a lot over that time and played with a lot of different different players over that period and then culminated in most recent success. And how was it moving down and playing in, in this league against a lot of the English players that you'd have played alongside or play oh, sorry, played against growing up over the years? Was it was it a bit of a uh was it was it quite a challenge or was it sort of the, the level that you were you were already playing at and it was just, you know, just different players playing against. Piece of cake, mate. They're all rubbish. Um, no, I think, honestly, for me, I moved when I was 18. So looking back, it's, it's kind of a big jump at the time, but I didn't really think about it. And um, I, I remember just going to training and kind of being like, blame me, I'm warming up here with Delos and Gumbo and all these guys had kind of just been watching on at the commies like the, that year or um and it was kind of like wow and then the more you just play there in that level the more you kind of get up to speed and it becomes the norm and um 
just get a bit more confident in yourself as, as time goes on? The games were definitely harder. I think I was pretty lucky coming from well, near the end of the sort of Kelburn days. The team wasn't the same as what it used to be, but sort of growing up with the standard of players that were at Kelburn at the time, it was pretty high quality training because we had about 10, 11 people who were also playing for Scotland, like Niall Stott, Mike Christie, people like that. John, like Johnny, the Christie brothers, I feel like the training was hard and at a high tempo. That's like Dell coaching. So I was sort of used to high tempo training, but the games were definitely a lot closer and a lot harder sort of coming into it. And I don't know, I think Grass and I probably had similar sort of upbringing from club and sort of from my parents. Like you sort of knew that it's not going to be an easy ride just going into it. So you sort of knew you had to sort of perform from minute one to to where you are now, you wouldn't take it any different from the first training session to, what was it, seven years later to training when it comes in, in September. So you sort of know that you wanted to be the best you could be and obviously show that you deserve to sort of be in the team no matter who you are up against in your own team to like get in the team or who you're playing against. So, But definitely the games were a lot closer than what they probably were back in, back in Scotland. And... Both of you then had been over here for a, for a few years and, and seen the women's team win, I think, the first two or three of their titles before you guys went and won the league in, in quite dramatic circumstances. How did how did that feel, you know, being crowned the, the best, being part of the best English men's team in, in the country? Great, yeah. I think, same with anything, like you watch other teams be successful and you want you want to be a part of it. Um, you want to have that in your own team so yeah it was um, it was brilliant to be honest I think Serpton had always had a bit of when I first came down I feel like Serpton had a bit of a bad rep amongst other teams and umpires and whoever for probably culture and um, the way the team played and things like that so I think most satisfying was to have been a part of changing that culture and turning it into a team that is a proper team and a successful one at that and um yeah I think that clearly we now have a lot of good good players there but a lot of good people as well and that's definitely helped to um push the team on and, and do really well and um yeah who doesn't want to be a team that's winning yeah yeah I think I think we deserve, we deserved it no first year was probably well, three three nil down, <laughs> so maybe not deserved it. But I think from there we've sort of like always done really well, and at times shown how good we can be, and that's came across. And the girls have won, I think, seven in a row. I want to say, I think seven in a row. So yeah, uh, it was about time the guys did something <laughs> to get some sort of trophy in the club next to theirs. I've got Robin next to me going, yeah, it's seven. It's actually seven. <laughs> and that first that first final where you were three nil down and I think with with ten minutes to play, you came back to draw three all and take the title on a shootout. I guess can you sort of talk us through through that final and, and, and how it unfolded from your perspectives? Well we sort of went into it thinking we will we'll win this because we knew we had a good squad and then Wimbledon were obviously very good as well and we just thought it was, we didn't underestimate them we just we just didn't perform as well I think that maybe the occasion got was a little bit of a surprise that some got into it because they hadn't played and then some sort of played for the title before or whatever and then it was funny like I remember the the quarter time t- the last quarter team talk got into the last 15, 17 minutes and and for me I would from what you're you're sort of used to, you're three 0 down, get a bit of a kick in to like get you motivated to go out. And I remember apparently just being like, We've got seventeen minutes. You guys should score three goals in two minutes, so you get plenty of time. And I remember being like really annoyed at that. <laughs> I was like, You needed to like give some boys a hammer in there to like get them ready. And like seventeen goes to ten. I don't think we'd scored yet. I think pretty sure maybe eleven. I think still three 0 down. I'm like, what's going on? And then fair play, like 
I think Daz for long hadn't actually played much in the final. He hadn't been on. And he came on, got a corner, scored, got another corner. I think Bales rebounded it and then we scored from from the rebound. I think it, yeah, we scored the second and then it was uh, we got went with the boy like we have a bit of a sort of funny culture at training when like at the time when Gaz was there, like when he wasn't flicking it, like people like Gooders and Ards would always give him chat about how much better they could flick when obviously they couldn't flick it at all, just to like wind them up. And then three two down, we're like, we really need this to go in to get you out. So everyone's thinking we're going to be focused. And we all go into the huddle and we just start like, not like giving them stick. We're like, oh, Gaz, you better score this, mate, else, else that's it, sort of thing. And Gooders was very good at sort of like giving, giving them the chat. And, to be fair to him, stepped up, scored. And then I think Quadri went in from 3-0 down to 3-3, going into the shootouts. It was like we knew we were going to win. And no matter what, he sort of just knew, yeah, we've completely won this. Because if you're 3-0 up and you go into a, and then goes into a shootout, you're probably thinking, well, we've thrown this away sort of thing. So you're going into a different mood at the team talk to pick, pick out your, your penalty shootout take, takers. And we'd spent the Thursday night I was doing a lot of shouts and Gibble was brilliant in the shouts so in training so we were pretty confident going in that he was going to do pretty well and it, yeah it showed well, I, I was at home injured unsurprisingly uh, <laughs> uh, pretty sure I was crying because I was like sad I wasn't part of it and uh, all that because I'd wanted to to win it for a while but um, yeah it was just like it's just nice to be part of a team that's winning and you know that you're the best team and yeah, it's a good feeling. And then the following year for you, Grass, I think you, you were back and you were playing in the final and you were able to lift the trophy. Am I, am I, is that right? Uh, yeah, not actually the real trophy because England Hockey had managed to... to no, it was somebody, us. Was it us? I was stubborn. So, so, so we I, were meant to bring it. We, so I do apologise. Our, our manager was asked to bring the trophy. Because obviously we won it a year before. You bring it back to the playoffs. So if you think, and we rocked off, and we didn't bring the trophy back. It's Jonesy presuming it's not needing to to yeah, go anywhere else. Yeah, we didn't bring it back. So that was all. There, that was already like before the final. We didn't yeah. bring the trophy back. So like, oh, suburban or arrogant because they've not brought the trophy back. I think. <laughs> I'm like, either way, I think if we win this, we would like to lift the proper trophy. So we would like to bring it with us. Yeah, but um, no, that was like, yeah, no matter. Is that the last game I played? Served him. Yeah. Yeah, that was the last time. That, that, that was just after commies. Yeah, ages ago. That was basically when I was, my leg started really getting buggered. Like I couldn't, I was kind of hobbling through that final. Um, yeah, you played, you played, you went from high mid to deep screen. Yeah, I couldn't run. Um, <laughs> I was kind of, that's basically my main memories of hockey. I couldn't run. Um, yeah, so no, that was just brilliant. Like, so chuffed that managed to to win it um, and be part of that. I was, I mean, we've got some good videos in the changing room after and yeah. back at the clubhouse and stuff. It was just like a really good good time. Well, that, that was our turn to nearly throw it away, being ahead yeah. and then it going to, then it going to shoot out. Oh, I couldn't watch the last, um, I couldn't watch the shootout. Yeah. yeah, there's a good, there's a, I think there's a funny video of you. I was like, I'm pretty sure from a different, so, so where everyone lines up and like you're, Groups of five, to, well, we were taking the shootouts, and then everyone else is normally like halfway line or just behind the group. And you're walking up, you're like walking up and down like away from the goal. <laughs> when I'm take, I think I take our first sudden death one, you're like not watching, and then you miss Gibble saving it to win it. I think I was like the most stressed I've ever been, but cause ev- um, cause everyone's in the, everyone's together. Like everyone makes it because closer, and then you come in like so late because you're so yeah. far away. And because I couldn't run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but also that, but you're also like <laughs> from everyone else. Oh no, yeah. And then you're like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that was just great. It's just well chuffed to to win it. And that was obviously a, a positive, a really positive sort of way to to play your last game for Surbiton, although you didn't know it at the time, and, and your last game for Great Britain as well, being at the stoop and being on the pitch alongside Alan, um, making hockey history. For that, how was that whole experience for the both of you 
because it was a pretty pretty epic day and I must have it must have been so special to to be a part of it yeah it was quite a um it was brilliant to be honest yeah like started off the day by winning the crossbar competition (laughs) Uh, (laughs) that was probably the day before I don't know but um I was just it was just brilliant to to be a part of the crowd was huge and uh it really was like a well-run sort of couple of matches by everyone who organised it and um, great for a great advertisement for hockey in, in Great Britain and the fact we won the game as well, yeah, it was just, it was just really good. Um, as I said before, uh, maybe on something else, that I kind of like, I really could, I couldn't run. Like before the game, I was cramping up in the morning doing our like morning walk and stretch, which actually turned into a bit of a jog and kind of mobility and getting your legs going a bit. But I was like doing heel flicks and my hamstring was cramping. I was like, ah, this isn't good. This is not. This is not where I need to be. Um, so it was. A, it was a, a really strange one between really enjoying the occasion, focusing on actually trying to win the game and trying to forget the fact that I felt like my hamstring was going to ping most times I sort of pushed off on it. So I think I hit it fairly well, but like realistically, anyone who knows me knew like I can run a wee bit quicker than that. Um, so yeah, it was a strange one, but equally I'll like looking back on it, what a game to finish on. Um, so I'm really happy in that respect. Yeah. I mean, being able to play in in the stadium with that many people for like a one-off game is, yeah, you'd never expect that to happen. It's one of the other like tournaments you expect to, and even here, like you don't met even other tournaments you've played in, and you don't play in front of that many people. So in Britain, so to play that in one game is brilliant. But like you said, I think I remember talking to you at halftime, grass because we're next to each other, and you're like, <laughs> where are you going? I can't run. I can't run. I was like, just, just try, just try. <laughs> it's like no. Um, but no, it's yeah. I mean, I think for Grass's last game, playing that, I don't think you'll play in a, a better sort of stadium, sort of thing. It was the same as the Holland game. Playing that, and I was like, pretty good yeah. crowd in the evening. Quite a lot of people there. Quite an intense game. Good game as well, yeah. Yeah. So I was pretty. Yeah, pretty cool to be able to play in his last two games, to be honest. That was yeah, meaningful. It was great. And you also had that special moment of, of sharing Alan's Great Britain debut. You, you were both on the pitch together for that as well. Uh, what, I guess, sort of, you have that you mentioned those two games there, but what are some of your favourite memories of, of representing Great Britain together? Because you did so on a, on a few occasions. Raipur? Right, right, Raipur was. Um, Oh yeah, I mean, we beat Australia five two. When was the last time? So, sort of, with that sort of comfortable performance as well, and then obviously we're Belgium are now. We drew two two with Belgium as well. Finished top of the group. And then obviously the quarter final didn't quite go our way, but I think the whole that ride pool experience was was fun as well because yeah, you normally go to basically India a lot now. Sorry, and of Delhi or look now and then you go to India. Never really I don't think we've ever been to Ride Pool since, to be honest. But, um it was just such a surreal place. Like remember we were going to the shopping centre at the bottom of the road from the hotel. We've got two armed guards walk it like we're going into the sports shop with two armed guards following us as like yeah, an escort. Just ridiculous, like walking down the street. It was probably it was slightly like, overkill, but it yeah. was probably slightly overkill, but it was still good. I mean, if I got in a fight, I'd be useless, but if I was with you, then it would be all right. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> yeah, I just don't understand why. I think it was policy of the tournament or the hotel. Yeah. You're like walking through the supermarket or whatever, <laughs> just get these two guys with like huge guns. I'm like, I'm only out for a coffee. Why, why are you with me? Yeah. <laughs> we're, I think, we're I like, think what's, we're what's to... nice is like, uh, Obviously, just being a part of the squad together and both English boys are probably 
roll their eyes, but like both being Scottish and um, just kind of almost like feeling like you're both just achieving something great, being a part of it and pushing on. And um, I think probably for, well, the biggest thing I missed probably about playing was like our connection on the pitch. Because I think we always, just always clicked and I knew what you were doing and you knew what I was doing. And it kind of just really helped and uh, made some, yeah, lots of games really enjoyable. We used to get some a lot of stick at Scottish stuff. Yeah. Because um, we were obviously down south together. And like any time, and if tr- we're doing a train next size and we were in the same team or whatever, anything like that, all the boys would be like, oh, so good. Like, just saw, like, giving us so much chat. If, like, we do, and we would, we'd always nibble. The two of us would always, like, react. We'd give them, like, the most ridiculous comebacks. Oh, well, it works, doesn't it? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> just ridiculous. So we get up quite a lot, but yeah. I don't think I would have played scored as much if Kraft didn't pass me the ball. So that always helps having him behind me. <laughs> Going back to, to being in Raipur, being in India, what's it like playing hockey in in a completely different environment with a completely different different atmosphere? Sort of what what is it like playing in India compared to playing sort of over here? How much different is it? <laughs> it's just me- yeah. it's mental. So you you'd you'd already played like daily Commonwealth games. Daily, yeah. You had like a taste of Indian crowds and how mental it can be and loud. Yeah. But that was my first time. And um, it was great because we got to play India in the tournament, which was just, yeah, like huge crowds. I, mean, I don't know, 10,000. Yeah. It sounded like 20. Like it was just, they just go mental every time India attack and you just can't hear anything that we say to each other. Um, and I think... Probably, like, it just shows you how big hockey is in India because you'd finish a game and um, there'd be fans, like, down the side of the stands, like, screaming, like, Ashley Jackson, Barry Middleton, say, like, hello. Like, they just they just know exactly who certain people are and you just realise how big hockey is there. Um, they obviously forgot our names, but... Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just so weird when you're on the pitch. And you can you can hear the person next to you shouting your name when they were yeah. attacking at times because right right pool was it was quite close in as well. So it wasn't you know, to like compare it to Delhi. They've got the big stadium, so they're a bit further away. Whereas right pool was like sideline gate stand, so it was just like ridiculous how close they were, and they would be going off their head like they make a tackle on their own twenty five, and it's like it erupts because all of a sudden they know they've got the ball. And then like it's just, oh, and even when you get a, a like and they get a corner, and you're like on the bench, you just hear them all like stamping and yeah, it's bro, it's brilliant. You wish like as much as when you go up, there's India had its probably downfalls and you're there because of, like the food and everything like that. But playing in the in the games is you get so it's a real good buzz playing playing in them just just because of the crowd like we even when we played. Belgium, so it was an evening game. It was still busy because it was on, like the game was on, so they still packed the. And then that's when they just sort of cheer when anyone attacks. They're not there supporting a team; they're just there supporting hockey. And if yeah. we attack, they were like going crazy when uh, Belgium attack. They were going crazy. So you just it's just it's brilliant to go out and then after the game they're all just like chasing after the bus and everything like that. It's just sort of very unique. Yeah place to play you don't really get it anywhere else talking about security for just going to the shops but the security for getting from the hotel to the hockey pitch it's probably about a half an hour drive but we got like big police escorts and then when we played the india game we had like an army truck at the front with like a big machine gun and i don't know 10 police cars in some sort of cordon um taking us yeah. to the game which was also totally bizarre. Um. Yeah, it's just yeah, you just you just don't experience anything like it anywhere else. No. Um, it's just, yeah, like it's just so unique. But but you always come back and you're always like, what is what's just happened, sort of thing. And then you go and play 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 a home game here. 
you just walk to the pitch from Lake yeah. Valley and it's absolutely fine. Yeah. <laughs> but playing those games in with those bigger crowds and those amazing atmospheres, do you think that that brings out the best in you? In, in the, are they the, the most enjoyable games when you know that there are thousands of people there watching you and, well, cheering you on in some cases? Um, maybe not in India so much when you're playing India, but... Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it, it, it makes it, but I just think any game you sort of play for, like Scotland or GB, you try and as, as much as you say, or you, you don't hear the crowd, obviously you hear the crowd, so people say that, but like, you just want to play and you you want to enjoy basically playing for your country. And So I, I wouldn't say one's more special than another, in a way. There's more that you'll look back at and like we remember that like it was yesterday sort of thing. But I wouldn't say there's one more. For me, there's definitely not one more special than another. It all means the same sort of thing. I think, yeah, you, you can just tell it's like the bigger crowd generally is a more high-pressured game and you just want to play in more games that mean stuff and it probably brings the best out in us, um, I'd like to think. So, yeah, just great experiences. And to, to finish off this podcast, we've spoken about so many different experiences that the two of you have had playing hockey together, whether it be for Scotland, Great Britain or Surbiton. But would there would you say there's one particular standout memory at all of, of your time playing together or that, that sums up the friendship the two of you have uh, in the best way? Personally, for me, I just think... Well, there's obviously like certain games that we've already spoken about, like the Europeans and stuff. But I think just knowing if we're on the same team, I just know if I like lift my head up, I know Al and I'll be available, kind of thing. And it's just like that connection that I've already spoken about, and I think that's probably the best part about being in the same teams together. Um, probably brought the best out of each other. Yeah, yeah, based on what he said, but also from a non playing part, just it's is sort of I know I'll get absolutely ripped for saying it, but just being able to do it with your best mate is is sort of good enough. And in a way, like if you think what we've sort of achieved and what we've done in the last say nine, ten years, I don't know, we're getting a bit older, so it's probably mm. longer than I think, but being able to do it and do it with three different teams is pretty pretty cool and yeah we've sort of came through as like obviously rival teams in Scotland like Kelburn and Inverleaf to then play in the same club team down here and then take Scotland and GB that the stuff like that that you remember play over the results that I got to do it with your best mate so it's pretty yeah that's sort of the main thing I wouldn't I wouldn't point out a particular moment for me I would just say that the sort of last nine, ten years have been been pretty special. So do tell I you tear, what, um, do I tear gra- tear grass up or anything? Uh, I'm getting a bit emotional. Already. Um, just I tell you what, I won't miss is uh, rooming together and before going to sleep. Like, like I am the lightest sleeper ever, and Alan will put on Family Guy. So he has to watch that to sleep too. And it does my head in because I'll. I'll basically wake wake up to the noise of Family Guy at midnight or one in the morning, whilst I'm sound asleep, snoring, doesn't care. So I get I wake up to have to then turn it off, but he can't go to sleep without Family Guy on. So just basically no, doesn't it's not, work. Not, it's but these are the it's things. Not always family, it's not always Family Guy. It was just still game. We went through a period. We went through a period of all the trips that Family Guy was just on my hard drive, so I could watch it. I just like watch something. And the good thing Sorry, is. Yeah. Now, Normally, you'd be watching clips, like, you know, attacking the circle on the right. And <laughs> oh, shut yeah, up. I'd, I'd have to turn it off. I'm like, Alan, uh, you know this already. Uh, um, now, the good thing is, uh, Robin now watches stuff as well, so it's perfect. Oh, uh, isn't that cute? It's what out, whereas with Grass, he used to pretend he'd watch stuff with me, but it doesn't, so. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Grass used to, used to complain a lot about that. Uh, oh, that's my biggest problem. If, 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 if I'm going to call out, what about how many times do you go to the toilet during the night? From on the yeah. <laughs> and how Especially many times when you've got a pee test. 
Yeah, how many times are you up and down to the toilet when I'm trying to sleep? Well, like minimum, sure. I'm talking, I'm talking minimum four times. No, nah, like three, three. Nah, comfortably more than three. <laughs> in the toilet, light on, and you go, oh. Well, See, we're going to we're going to start calling them out, Chris. I can, I'll bring them out. Now I don't have pee test in the morning, so I can just I'll sleep fine. Yeah, feel like we've started. Now, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's been good. With, with, I think actually, for Scotland, we probably room. I think we first probably since twenty thirteen. Yeah, quite we, a while. Like we roomed all the time together. But before that, you sort of shared it out most. But then we got we just get put together probably because no one else wanted to room with us. But yeah, yeah. it's been a, a a long room and list sort of. 2013 to 2018. Yeah. Long time. So I know each other's habits. And Good then, and bad, by, we'll, by clearly. I won't share those. Clearly. And, and then finally, you said that you have actually sort of spent three months apart. Chris, you're up in Scotland and you're still down uh, here in England. Um, when this all eventually does calm down and, and we sort of go back to some sort of normality, have you got any particular plans and on what you're going to do in your first sort of catch-up or anything like that together? There's, there's a few. Some you probably can't say on the GB podcast. But, um, yeah. <laughs> we'll go we'll brunch. We'll go for brunch, coffee, yeah. and then obviously now golf. Yeah. We'll come back down. And yeah. then I'll, I'll tell you the rest, Well, off, off soon. <laughs> probably chat a lot of rubbish. And, uh, yeah, just, just talk coffee. nonsense. And then get stick for talking rubbish to each other so whatever well, else happens yeah well it sounds good and thank you very much both for joining us and we will be back with more inside the circle of the podcast in two weeks time <laughs> Once again, many thanks to Chris and Alan for their time this week and for giving us yet another great interview. We will be returning in two weeks' time. And in the meantime, make sure you have subscribed to Inside the Circle, the podcast, on all of your usual podcast providers.